Welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine podcast. And um, we're talking to uh, Lachlan Chartier from ANSTO. And uh, for those overseas viewers, ANSTO is uh, the um, the Australian, the largest Australian nuclear medicine production facility. That's what they're best known for. Um, they've got the, uh, the uh, nuclear reactor in Sydney. Um, I'm in Melbourne, and um, but they also do lots of other things. They do calibration of machines. They develop other instruments. Um, uh, they produce um, uh, much of the uh, reactor produced uh, product that's used in Australia, and and in particular ferronostics, which we've talked about previously. But this time we're going to talk about something a little bit different, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, something that got media attention this year, quite got a lot of media attention. Um, so so let's start, uh, Lachlan, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, what's your background? Where are you from? Uh, yeah, so I am, uh, I guess, originally from uh, Canberra uh, and then uh, went to uni uh, at the University of Wollongong. Uh, did my PhD there in um, microdosimetry, uh, which is essentially uh, detection of um, radiation in cell-sized uh, detector volumes in silicon. Uh, and then I was able to secure a job here at Anster at Lucas Heights. Uh, I think it was in 2017. So I've been here for about six years now uh, in the um, Anster detection and imaging team. And we basically produce uh, radiation detection solutions and um, yeah, offer advice uh, to government and other government agencies um, about radiation detection and, and other sort of scenarios. So yeah. Right. So, um, so we're going to talk today about the um, Chorus 360. Now, um, this is a device that was uh, that's that's being developed by Ansto. Is that correct? And yeah, yeah. Uh, it was. Um, it, I think the idea uh, was conceived in the early uh, teens uh, by my boss, Dr. David Boardman. Um, and yeah, since, since from then on, we've been developing it for the last, you know, sort of eight to 10 years sort of thing. And we're at a point now where it's fully commercialized and fully available. Um, uh, and it's, uh, and it's, it's now sort of a, a commercial product. Um, yeah. And obviously we, we used it, we used it in WA as well. Um, well before we get to how it's used, let's talk a bit, how, a bit, a bit about what it does. What's yeah, it do? Yeah. yeah so uh, it's a, it's a, it's a gamma ray imager. Um, so pretty much it's, it's, it's like taking a camera, uh, uh, an optical photo, I guess, but for, for radiation. And so it's a static imager. So the idea is, is that if you suspect that there's radiation, um, in a particular area, whether that be, you know, a hospital or a nuclear reactor, obviously there's going to be radiation there, but, um, uh, you can basically put it in the room, um, and it will, uh, do a, uh, I guess a scan. It's got two, um, rotating uh, tungsten collimators inside with a single detector crystal in the middle. And so basically what it does is to take an image, um, it, it configures the mask in some orientation and it will take a few, uh, you know, depending on the sampling time, it might take five seconds worth of data from the surrounding environment. Um, and because it's a scintillator crystal, um, it's obviously going to produce an energy spectrum. And so using uh, that uh, data, uh, it'll 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 rotate the mask to the next uh, position, uh, and so pretty much what you're doing is with these masks is every time you do a a, a measurement, you're basically changing uh, what radiation is allowed uh, to enter the detector, and so depending on where the radiation is, you are going to basically be getting a um, uh, a modulating detector signal based on the uh, position of the masks. And so using that and using a technique called compressed sensing, you can actually reconstruct the image um, or the, the location of where the radiation is coming from uh, in less samples than the number of pixels in this image. So um, basically you put it in a room, it'll do the image and it will uh, produce a 360 degree optical panorama using the four cameras here. And uh, it will overlay a heat map uh, onto that image. So you're able to visually go, oh, the, the radiation is over there on that wall or through that barrier or coming from that uh, sort of drum. Um, right. So it's kind of got two collimators in it sort of, isn't yeah. it? Like, 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 yeah, yeah. So, so the people in, on this podcast, most of them are probably familiar with SPECT imaging and yeah. you've got a static collimator on a SPECT image. So it's a bit like yeah. 
looking down a drinking straw um, and seeing yeah, right. coming from one direction. But what you're doing is you're overlapping lots of drinking straws on top of each other and moving yeah. them around, if you like, so that so that you can see different different parts of a 360 degree environment at diff, different times. And, yeah. And those kind of yeah. Yeah, and the holes aren't everywhere. They're sort of um, no. They're, 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 it looks a bit like a QR code, I think. It, 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 it right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it, it sort of is like a QR code. And, yeah, so in one mask position, you're purposely blocking off some of the radiation, some of the scene. And so, and then in the next rotation, when you rotate them again, you're blocking off another random part of the scene. And so it's this it's this random nature of the, the mask patterns that um, helps uh, the compressed sensing algorithm figure out where the source is coming from. Yeah, so... Right, yeah. and so then it's, it it's, takes yeah. a 360 degree photograph and sticks on top of that the radiation measurements that it's got. Yeah, so, that's exactly so, right. Yeah. So if you've got a room where you've gone and spilt some uh, theranostic stuff on the floor, right, and you don't know exactly where it's spilt, you, your Geiger count is uh, showing up, but a Geiger count is not very directional. So right. you pop this in the room, turn it on, and it'll take a picture of the room, and there it is yeah. right underneath the tap or... In the in the patient's shoes or <laughs> on the bed clothing or wherever it happens to be, it'll show up yes. a hot blob, right? Yes. So, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So that's that's how it works. Um, yeah. And uh, that seems to me to be incredibly useful because these days we're not just doing imaging in with a spec camera or a pit camera. What we're doing is going out and administering theranostics to patients. Those patients. Um, um, uh, sometimes are not 100% uh, accurate where they uh, uh, urinate or, <laughs> or where they leave their clothes or spit or, yeah. or, 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 uh, or whatever. And, and so it can be a real task trying to gather up all that radioactive stuff and store it safely until it decays away. And I think this is the kind of use that you could see a nuclear medicine application for, or operating theatre where you, you're giving it in a, in a uh, you're giving, um, for example, therospheres for, for, a, for, a, for a liver tumour. You might, you might want to check that some of the, check there hasn't been any contamination of the operating theatre when you did that. Yep. Um, uh, those kinds of things. But maybe there's, there's are some other uses too. Um, I, I recently spoke to people from the army. I gave lectures to the to the army where they were um, where they had the uh, uh, the people who were going to deal with dirty bombs, for example, right? And yeah. so, if we had a dirty bomb or a um, a terrorist attack, um, you could you could pop this down, even drop it by helicopter, maybe, and then and then get it to take a picture, and it'll tell you where that radioactive material has landed. Um, well, well, I'd almost rather use it before the dirty bomb went off, uh, so as to be able to, you know, in sort of a threat sort of space, to be able to prevent this accident from even happening, which would which would be a lot easier as well because it would be contained, it'd be a point source in someone's backpack or whatever they're doing. Um, right. And then so, you're obviously able to prevent the prevent the explosion in the first place. So you could use it at a point of entry at a port. You Absolutely. could use it in a high security area, you know, like the White House, for example. That's right. right. Um, to, uh, so you could screen people who are coming into into that area, and it would be a very simple, quick, and easy way. Anybody who's ever had to deal with a even an old old fashioned ID one thirty one cleanup knows how tedious and time consuming it is to actually go and find a radiation spill or a radiation thing it's really a complete pain in the neck um, but I guess the other thing we might want to talk about is what happened in Western Australia which which I'll set the scene is probably the worst case scenario you could possibly imagine for finding radioactive contamination so 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 correct me if I'm wrong here but wasn't there one of those sealed sources they use for for checking bores um, um, uh, lost uh, came off a truck somewhere uh, they think um, they're not sure um, from a mine in Western Australia now for our international viewers Western Australia is about as big as Europe <laughs> it is vast <laughs> from one end of Western Australia to the other it's it's literally thousands and thousands of kilometers and um, that thousands of kilometres is across across the desert. 
right? And it's it's a really vast area. And so when they went and shipped this radioactive source from a mine back to Perth, which is literally from one end of uh, of um, of Western Australia to the other, when they got to Perth, they couldn't find it. So they figured it must have gone missing on the route somewhere. Um, so they had to go and find it. And everybody thought this is going to be impossible to find. Everybody said that. But tell us a bit about what happened. Tell us a bit. Were you involved in this personally? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, well uh, basically, uh, I think we were informed on the Friday that um, our PANZA, which um, for those overseas is our nuclear uh, regulator, and uh, uh, they, they basically said, hey, a source has gone missing uh, officially, and they requested uh, ANSTO to help. Um, and so I think it was on the Sunday morning uh, I got uh, woken up by my boss, uh, and he's like, "Come in." Uh, and so what we were, what we had to do was basically get our Chorus 360 um, uh, modified slightly to be able to because this is a static uh, imaging device. So basically, the radio uh, it physically needs to be in place when it takes an image, and it also the radiation scene needs to be fairly constant. Um, you know, otherwise it's like blurring an optical image sort of thing. Um, so we were actually able to modify this to be able to do very quick acquisitions, not not in an imaging sense, but in a in a just a normal detection mode. So uh, we modified it. We put a three inch sodium iodide detector in there, um, which is bigger than the normal uh, 1.5 um, uh, gamma neutron detector that we use, which is um, CLLBC material. And um, yeah, we were able to modify it so that it worked really quickly because we wanted to. Um, if you drove past the source, we wanted to be able to make sure we were getting good spectra um, every uh, X number of metres to make sure that we had that good uh, spatial resolution on the road. Um, and so, yeah, we came in, we did our modifications, and then uh, because we're at ANSTO and we have these um, similar radioactive sources, we're able to acquire uh, an equivalent 20-gig um, uh, cesium source. We basically put it on the side of the road on site. We got we got our emergency response people to uh, close the roads and everything in sight. And then we did um, test runs where we uh, travelled between 40 and 70 kilometres per hour, just making sure that we would be able to detect the source if it was, you know, 10, 15, 30 metres away from the road. Um, oh, so, so, so where did you do this? Did you do this in Sydney or? Did yeah. You... Yeah. In Lucas, Lucas Heights. Off just... the road in Sydney. Uh, no, no, sorry. It was on site, on campus, within the Ansto grounds. Right. Um, so obviously, yeah, we, we're used to um, uh, substances like this. And so, you know, we were able to do that safely without affecting the public. Right. Um, and, and, yeah. and of course, we've, we've known where, um, where, the, where radioactive sources have gone missing on. in the past um, and, and they've never been found. I mean, there wasn't there one in... Uh, uh, the one in Russia recently, and wasn't there one in, in the Balkans recently that where where, where that, that went missing? And there's been some go missing in uh, in Mexico and places like this. And and some of these have caused great harm to people. though, radiation sufficient to 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 to, to, um, to cause damage to people, right? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Especially if they're the strong ones. Um, this one right. was particularly it wasn't particularly strong but it, it definitely could cause cause damage if somebody right. was I mean, it's not only purpose. it's not any sources for bores it's right uh, particularly in the old days we had radiotherapy sources for cobalt 60 right yeah, and, yeah that's exactly right and, that, and they were quite quite damaging and then there was of course um there's uh there's been uh portable uh heaters that are made of radioactive material that used for heating up um, electronics in Arctic regions, uh, Russia's used those, right? And sometimes yeah. they've gone missing. So, um, uh, yeah. so th there's there's lots of situations where you absolutely want to find these things, uh, absolutely, and put, and put them in a in a in a safe place, and uh, and you want to do it in a way that's um, not going to harm the people present. So, if you're driving fast in a truck then you're not likely to be spending loitering a long period of time holding a Geiger counter, waving it in front of a radioactive source. So it's going to be right. a relatively safe thing to do, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, but, yeah, so once we, were, once we were very happy that we were able to do it, we, we shipped off to Western Australia, a group of, I think, uh, uh, eight people or something like that from ANSTO, two teams that we went over. Um, and uh, just to ensure that the source hadn't been picked up by a tyre or something like that and then taken into Metro Perth, 
Um, I think there was two to three teams that were searching the, the Metro Perth area to make sure that that hadn't uh, uh, fallen off the truck um, in Perth. Um, thankfully, it hadn't. And then a team of me and my colleague, um, Prashant, we went up north to Newman, which is the town, the mining town closest to the to the mine. And so um, the, the, the Australian Defence Force had also been involved. They had left Perth on the Monday and were travelling with their detection equipment by road up north to the mine. And so... Um, we, uh, uh, me and my colleague, uh, along with the, um, uh, the Western Australian uh, Fireys, uh, we started uh, looking on the uh, Wednesday morning, I think it was, and a bit, uh, we searched Newman, the mining town, just the streets to make sure, again, that it hadn't been picked up by a tie tread um, and was near a residential area. Once we cleared that, um, we went to all the checkpoints where the, the truck had gone uh, during its route up, up, up there. And then, yeah, coming down south, just one hour south, uh, we were just talking in the car, um, learning about the uh, the history of I think it was Fiji at the time, and then boom, the uh, the that 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 lovely six six two kV peak just spiked on all of our instruments instantly as we went past it, and uh, we you know we just sort of yelled out in surprise, I guess, uh, very exciting, and uh, yeah. Then we uh, then we pulled over and um, right. But then you had to find where it is because, I mean, yeah. Newman is in Western Australia, northern Western Australia, and and uh, it's it's covered in red dust, right? The whole the whole of that area of Western Australia is 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 red dust. It's uh, uh, it's an iron ore mine, New, Mount Newman, I think, isn't it? So it's uh, it's uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but yeah, yeah but it's, it's definitely it's definitely red for sure. But um, thankfully, red, it wasn't very it wasn't very dusty, but it was very gravelly. Yeah, like you said, there's a lot of um, yeah rocks with iron in them, so very distinct colour, very metallic colour as well. And so yeah, that that little uh, silver bullet, little little thing, it was actually visually quite hard to see. Yeah. Um, so, so did you use it to actually find where it was in the in the? So what uh, what we what we actually did was um, my colleague Prashant, he had a tele detector, like a extendable detector, so he was able to sort of. Um, uh, manually figure out where it was while staying, you know, a few metres away from it. And so he, he basically just did a quick walk around just to see if he could find it visually quickly, and he did find it. Um, and once that was found, uh, he, we sort of um, spray-painted it, set up an exclusion zone, and then we used this to confirm that this was the location of the source. So at a distance of about 30 metres on the exclusion zone, we, were, uh, we took an image, and it's probably the image that um, you've seen in the papers, uh, showing just that big hot spot just on the desert floor. So, um, yeah, we used it to both first um, detect it in the car. So we, we had this in the back of the boot um, and it was just taking measurements as we were going along. And then once we'd visually confirmed it, uh, we did another uh, a gamma ray image and confirmed that it was the cesium source and it was located where we thought it was. So, yeah. Right. And it's uh, 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 600 kV uh, gamma rays, a fairly high energy gamma ray. So it's yeah. going to be fairly penetrating. You're going to be able to see it from a fair distance, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it'll it'll make it through the air for sure, and yeah, we'll be able to detect it quite easily with these detectors because we've got we've got quite a whole lot of high volume detectors. Um, but yeah, if it was even higher, we'd be fine as well. Um, you know, even if it was uh, cobalt or even if there was a very large you know thorium source, obviously we could be, we could detect the 2.6 MeV as well. Um, yeah, and if it was low energy, uh, we'd be able to do that as well. So yeah, right. And 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 the source has got a reasonably long half life. In fact, these sources are often used for for calibrating dose calibrators in uh, in uh, in the uh, uh, in in nuclear medicine departments, aren't they? Cesium one thirty seven. It's used as a as a check source in the morning quite quite often because it's right. simply because it's got a long half life. It means that you don't have to keep keep replacing it, but because it's got a long half-life it's also hazardous right that's it well yeah that's right it's, it's going to stay there for ages um I, I guess we can just be thankful that it was out in the desert uh and the likelihood of someone coming around to it was uh very low um unless it was a very unlucky you know uh, trucker who was gonna sort of sleep on the side of the road or something like that yeah it posed relatively little risk to anyone who, who would be out there um, right but you still want to get it back right Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's a yeah, it's a liability. You you have no idea where that's gone once it's out there, once it's loose. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a big risk for sure. Even though it is in the desert, yeah. 
Right. So um, have, has there been much interest in this um, uh, this device from uh, from uh, different agencies, from mining companies, from um, uh, from overseas uh, groups or anything like that? Uh, just generally, there's there's always interest in it. But yeah, it did it did peak a little bit with this um, event. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it did it did peak. It did peak for sure. Um, but yeah, we've been showing we've been showing this to to you know sort of uh, mining companies, other national labs, uh, defence, emergency services, um, the the whole time. So yeah, that's that's just really kept up for sure. Right. Yeah, no, it's a really cool device and and very uh, practical and portable. It's not very big. Um, for those who are listening to the to the audio podcast, it looks a bit about uh, it looks about the size of a large kettle or something along those lines. I'd say. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Don't, of, don't put coffee you know, in it, but yeah, it's a similar size. The size of a, a small backpack, I guess, would be about right. So yeah, it's, that's right. It's, and it's it, quite, uh, how much does it weigh to carry around? Yeah, so our version 1.1, I think it's released actually today. Uh, it's about 15 kilos, so, right, so. Um, not not too heavy. Um, it's it's uh, we've shaved quite a few kilos off the first um, variant. Uh, so yeah, it's, I'd say it's definitely portable and definitely definitely easy to carry. Like yeah, with one or two hands for sure. Right. So so yeah, but I mean I think that from the nuclear medicine point of view, particularly where people are. Uh, doing uh, out of hospital therapy where they want to go and survey a person's house to check yep. that, that they've done theranostics in a house. Um, um, places like Texas, for example, uh, they have they do almost all their therapies, I gather, in the home rather than in a hospital. And yep. and, they're, they're, and they're, they're places that uh, that do that. This, this is where you can go and double check the house to make sure that there's no um, radioactive material lying around the house before the kids come home. And yes. <laughs> and uh, um, that kind of thing. So I can see a, a particularly good use for that in, in, in that circumstance, particularly now that theranostics have, have really taken off. So I think it's a great idea. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we finish the podcast? Oh, it's just funny you said that. Uh, we actually did uh, one of our, uh, my colleagues' family members had a PET scan the other month and uh, we decided to image it. Um, image them as a person uh, right. with, with the radioactive material inside of them. And then as well, after they'd um, gone to the bathroom, where you yes. could visually see it in the in the toilet, and obviously nothing next to the toilet. But yeah, it's a it's a definitely could use it for that for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and we've done it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the you know one of, it's the toilet is always the thing that most people think about. But certainly, we found a significant amount. I, I know where theranostics is pretty common in Australia now. We have lots of stories about radioactive material ending up in 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 odd places mm -hmm. so so this this certainly could help uh, help with that if you're doing a large volume of theranostics and i think we will be because very rapidly we're finding that theranostics are becoming the standard way to to manage a lot of cancers neuroendocrine tumors prostate cancer and hopefully soon renal cancer breast cancer and so on so so i can see great uses for this uh for this device and uh thanks a lot for talking to us no worries at all my pleasure thanks for having me Thanks.